Hello and welcome back to Business with Co. Today we're going to be discussing franchising and, uh, you know, more specifically the final advantages and some of the disadvantages. So let's head straight in with the first one of them. Yeah, let's go. Um, this actually works for the franchisee. Sorry, for the franchise or not franchisee, which is motivation. See, generally an owner will be more attentive than a manager because franchising. This is uh, one thing that actually makes franchising very attractive to a franchisor because franchisor can be assured that the person is probably gonna, you know, you know, they'll be in a lot that they would because. The franchisor places this expansion in the heads of people who are motivated to make this work because they will benefit. They won't get a salary. Like, let's say your manager. Managers get a salary. And this is a problem, actually, that a lot of businesses have. Let's say you get a CEO. And CEO is getting paid a couple of million every single year. Um, business takes a downturn. And they need to cut salaries for other people. But the CEO goes, no. Why would, why would I take a cut? I'm going to keep it myself. And this is actually a thing which is actually interesting because some of the CEOs have actually driven the companies that are running into the ground. You see, the other thing is they don't own the business. They may have a percentage share or whatever it is to be, but like, they're CEOs, they don't own the business, they didn't come up with the business, nothing like that. They just got promoted or did, they just came in and got the job as a CEO by the board of directors. The problem is like, sometimes the board of directors will go, well, it's not really good enough for a movie, but if they have a good connection, then sometimes it's just like, no. CEOs have actually driven companies into the ground because of that thing where it's like, well, no, I have a salary, I'm going to continue to get that. I don't care if the business succeeds or not because I have lots of other jobs as well. And if you're getting a couple of million every single year as your salary, you're probably not going to care because, you know, you don't you don't need the job. Like, if I get paid, a like, if I was to get paid like 50 million for just being a CEO, then, you know, you're, if, you, if you're already having 50 million, it's unlikely you're going to need to worry about you know, anything like that. But that's the kind of situation to have your word. Managers don't tend to make the best people to put in charge because they are based on a salary or based on a wage, that kind of thing. They're not based off a company's success. Now, sometimes they may get a benefit if the company does succeed, you know, where like a, a cut of profits or something like that. But an owner has a much better thing there because that's the point of franchising. Because you're able to say to someone, you get to keep pretty much all the profits after we take our cut. So the profits are here. You paid your staff, you paid your fees, now we take our cut, we take our fee, we take our percentage, and boom, there you go, you can essentially ha have all that. Now sometimes the percentages and the fees that someone uh, that someone might have for the business can be colossal. Like, on an individual basis, millions have been made by some, you know, outlets by franchisees. Millions for that corporation. So sometimes it can be quite a big cut or if the business is making quite a lot of money then it can be a significant enough cut that it is taking quite a lot of money away. But, you know, sometimes it can just be that kind of thing where it's like, well, yeah, we've taken our, our slot and you get to keep the rest. And that kind of situation where it's like, besides the fact that you have to pay money to the original, to the franchiser, the franchiser then there is... Basically, it's the same as actually being the owner of a high-functioning business. That's what they have there. Um, you also have economies of scale because a franchisee can command uh, deals with various suppliers and control, you know, kind of supplies to various franchises because this kind of way it's like, well, we want, we need to get these for for a supply. We need to get these for a supply. So you buy these, um, buy these things, uh, and if you have one shop or. Let's say you've got 20 own, 20 completely company owned shops. Now, obviously, you put one deal, but let's say you have 190 more franchises. So you go, oh, well, now we have 190 more people we can actually send this to because they don't own, the, because they, tech, they technically own that business, but we still dictate a lot of the things to them. Is that where we say, okay, no, you'll, you'll take this, you'll buy this, here we bought this, this is your, this is what you have here. Uh, Isn't this going to be a problem when it's like, well, I actually don't need this, or, you know, I'm fully stocked up, but it's like, well, no, you're going to have to take this, because this, this is what, you know, you're going to have to just deal with it, you know. But you also have all these sort of the problems that, that come into this area. But there are also actually some disadvantages, because... There is a loss of control sometimes. See, while you do have control over a lot of things, especially if you have a, a very stringent contract, control over the kind of day-to-day -day management is 
kind of lost because unless you're kind of micromanaging, cause, and especially if you've got multiple franchises, then it's it's impossible to manage it like that. You know, yeah, basically the franchisor has to trust the franchisee to operate their own shops. Whereas if they opened up new stores themselves, they might have more control of their own decisions. Although you would, um, you could make the argument that, you know, let's say you're a business that has a thousand company owned shops. Well, you're going to find it very hard to manage the day to day running of every single one of them. You know, I mean, there's a lot of things involved in, in running a, just, a, just a single uh, uh, outlet. So if you're looking at it like that, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be quite a lot if you're going to be managing all of them. But you know, uh, basically, yeah, yeah, that's kind of the situation out there. Uh, you also have a reputation risk because the, re the reputation of the whole business could be affected by the actions of one franchise. You know, if one franchise has any of those things, poor college staff, all those kind of things. Any of those things that can happen because they're not pricing, they're not quality of food, they're not quality of goods, they're not anything like that. They're not, you know, anything. They're just sort of basic things that could happen. A good franchise that vets kind of potential franchises thoroughly before granting the information to run them. But the problem is, you know, if I'm a franchisee, I might have, I might hire some staff. I go, okay, here's, here's your job, boom, boom, boom. And they go, oh, sorry, no, we have to move on. They go, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll hire someone else. And the next person I hire, boom, boom. And after a while, then after a while, I hire someone who isn't that good. And then I hire someone else who's not good. And suddenly I'm beginning to cause a problem. I'm going to go, oh, but I feel kind of good. It's like, oh, I don't want to fire them. Mm. And that's an issue there. Although there can be a problem there where it's like, well, you know, sometimes... Depending on what the contract is, there can be a little bit of meddling in there with the whole manager, with the whole, um, sorry, owner of all the things. But you also have the cost and time that might be required to spend training. Now, sometimes some franchises don't really require training, you know, because as long as someone has kind of previous business experience, all they really are is the owner. They're not someone who does any of the jobs. They're not someone who, you know, makes any of the goods or sells any of the goods. They're not someone who works in the cash. They're not someone who does any of that. If that's the case that they are, if they're just managing it, you know, managing all the day-to-day -day things, basically what a manager would do, but they actually are the owner of that individual shop and they have to organize all the rent, they have to organize all the employee things and all that sort of stuff, then obviously, you know, they may not require training. But to a training program for franchises is, 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 is essential. This can be a very expensive and time consuming for the franchisor, but it can be crucial to upscale new franchises to not, I wouldn't say the issue would be to train them so much. I would say sometimes training is a bit of a, bit of a kind of a foolish word to use, but it'd be more, well, teaching them the strategies that that business would use. So teaching them the way that that, that business would do things. Cause you know, a business might be all, well, yeah, there's multiple ways to do this. Now, Obviously, your way is not wrong. If you had your own business, that would be a perfectly good way. In fact, sometimes it might even be a better way. But this is how we run things. And obviously, because you're a franchise of us, you would have to be the same as us. So, you know, this is the way you live. You know, I wouldn't so much call it training. I would call it more kind of uh, teaching to go along their line. Be there, be like them, you know. And kind of the process and ethos of the company, that sort of thing. There's also the uh, kind of thing with supervisation. Because franchisees tend to have this issue of... They need to be monitored regularly to ensure they're actually operating at a satisfactory level. Uh, of course, sometimes they may not need to be operated regularly. But the point is, it's like it's like one of those risk things. You know, you're, you're not necessarily that you, they need to be, otherwise they'll do something. It's more along the lines of that... The business needs to make sure, or they may not need to make sure, but like they, they, they might not want to take the risk that, you know, someone is in that. So, you know, that kind of thing was like, oh, yeah, we have to maintain quality standards of all the brand. But all of the things are actually just advantages and disadvantages of the franchise, or so they're not advantages and disadvantages of the franchisee. So, you know, just be aware of that if that's what you're, you know, you're talking about. But that's the kind of thing you have there where you're thinking this thing. Now, the thing is, how much does it cost roughly to set up a franchise? In some countries, it might be hundreds of thousands for big brands. Like, hundreds of thousands you're talking. Like, some businesses might be asking for half a million. Like, half a million 
for a business that you do not get anything paid for. You have to pay for all the rent, you have to pay for all the time, everything. All the upfront costs you have to pay for along with this thing. This half a million, keep in mind, does not pay for anything but the name. But the name, that's all it pays for. The name, the logo, all that sort of stuff. But it doesn't pay for anything else. And keep in mind, it's not like it even pays for getting the name, you know, you know, put on your shop windows. Like if you have a if you have a shop and you want to and you need to put the name on the shop windows or or the outside of it, and it's like, well, yeah, I need to do you need to maybe do up the internal. Actually, that's the thing you have uh, within contracts, which oftentimes whole system where it's like no no your shop has to look like any of our shops and that means you have to do massive interior decorating to match up with that um you know air, that kind of well <sighs> design um that's another thing that can actually you know because like one shop may be completely different to another in its size and its things that can kind of be a little bit complicated to do and there's all sorts of things in areas there that you know come into it where you have this kind of area where it's like yeah that all that money does is allow you to put the name and that's not that's just allowing you to put the name that's not they don't that's not that you still have to have the name you know whatever the way you put it on put on you still have to do all those things so really at the end of the day it can be a good deal for franchisee but a lot of the time it can actually be a relatively bad deal you know like it doesn't really have to wonder well what if the franchisee doesn't get actually any money out of it like you know, I mean, that's a lot of money for what is essentially, you know, that, that kind of money. Sure, you could buy a house for that. Like, there's all these sort of things. If obviously, if a, there are businesses that will only uh, lower amounts, but there's all these kind of things where, you know, injections of capital can be <laughs> useful for the business. But, you know, all these kind of things here, you have here. And there's also, in fact, uh, something different. There's also a thing known as inorganic expansion, uh, which would be i related to franchising. This has become a situation where you have, well, a business that uh, doesn't expand so, so nice, doesn't expand so, um, well, expands quickly, all these kind of things. Well, those are the kind of things we'll be talking about. In the next video, please do not want then if you don't want to. Well, I mean, there's all sorts of videos available, and you can also subscribe to the YouTube channel. That would help a whole bunch if you don't view the other videos, both now and in the future. I would just say this. Bye-bye for the night. I hope you enjoy the rest of your existence.